I think networking and most network design can be taken for granted often. And as someone who my degree is in networking, I often take for granted the network design and how IP protocol works and subnetting and VLANs. Um, I take that for granted because I've spent courses upon courses learning that. But as I get more into the cloud engineering field, a lot of my coworkers are computer scientists and they never had the opportunity to learn these kinds of things. So whether you're you know, getting a degree that's you know, not related to networking or IT, or you're learning this on your own, Networking can actually get pretty complicated based on you know topologies and different design methodologies. So I wanted to kind of kickstart a series here where we talk about different types of networking, how they apply, and where you're going to use them. So getting started, let's look at networking scope. Now this isn't an exact term for this, um, but I think it works pretty well. There is a bunch of different scopes of what kind of network you're working with. So we've got personal area network. Think like uh, Bluetooth. LAN, think of like, you know, Ethernet ports, uh, your WLAN or your wireless local access network. It's going to be have an access point. So, you know, think your router or, you know, an actual wireless access point. And then we're going to get into ones that are a little bit less common that you see day to day, like um, a metropolitan area network, a wide area network, a storage area network, um, and a virtual private network. So metro metropolitan area network is going to be a network with more of a backbone to support larger infrastructure and environments. So it doesn't have to be a city, even though as metropolitan in the title, take it more in the academic sense versus a larger region. And then wide area network is going to get even bigger than that. And then we're not going to dive too deep into storage area networks and VPNs, but um, storage area network is just, you know, a specialized type of network that focuses on storage infrastructure and sharing that between different computers and then a virtual private network you're probably pretty familiar with but you know it involves tunneling um, through a uh, metropolitan area network and a wide area network um, and tunneling your IP address so you actually end up in a different location right so these are just some of the examples there are definitely a lot more but these are the ones I really want to talk uh, touch on and talk about so starting with a personal area network think uh, Bluetooth or ultra wideband if you're familiar um, this is going to be a very small range and it's going to be for connecting very few devices. So, you know, you might have at most, you know, like your car Bluetooth, which is what this example would be for, you know, navigation or, you know, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, um, playing music off of your phone. Um, you can also think about maybe you have a, a door with a lock that has a personal area network attached to it. So when you get close with your phone, you can unlock it. That kind of concept, right? And then going just a bit wider out, um, and we're kind of looking at the University of Pittsburgh here, their medical hospital. Um, but I thought we would look at, you know, LAN. So LAN is going to be everything using, you know, uh, IEEE 802.11, right, or uh, Wi-Fi uh, and that kind of stuff. Or technically, it's 802.4. Um, but this is going to be, you know, how computers in a certain network talk to each other. There's a lot of advantages of a LAN over a personal area network or a PAN, right? So the biggest one is you can have many more devices. There's a lot of different topologies you can work with um, where like pretty much everything with Bluetooth is going to be more of like a star topology. Um, you get a lot more options here and you get to connect a lot more devices and you can spread it over a much larger distance. You know, you can have a LAN uh, network go like miles and miles and miles, right? kind of a LAN network that goes like under the sea and cabling. So uh, it's just, it's a lot more extensible. You can do a lot more with it. And it's going to be probably what you're most familiar with when you think networking. And outside of that, we got WLAN. So um, very similar concept, but this time it's wireless. So turn on some, oh, uh, what we can do here is I can, you know, so we've got, think of these as like, you know, Wi-Fi points where you can spread the signal out. It's the same concept, but again, you're adding a wireless access point here. So to connect to these, you're going to need an access point uh, or a router or a wireless card. You're going to need all of those to, you know, send and receive data over antennas, you know, through vibrations in the air. Then moving on, we're going to look at metropolitan area networks. And there's really two types here. It gets pretty broad. So this one I'm looking at is going to be more focusing on point to point connections. So you can actually think of, uh, there being antennas like on these roofs right here that are able to have a line of sight to each other and directly connect. So that is an example of a metropolitan area network. You can also do this with cabling under the ground if you really wanted to, you know, through some kind of like uh, 
underground tunneling system, uh, which is you know going to be how you get most of your like connection from your internet service provider. Um, but it's going to allow you to connect multiple like shared regions. So for example, these are all University of Pittsburgh establishments and they want to connect with each other without having to go all the way up to the ISP and back, right? So you're able to add some point to point antennas here and connect that way. And it's gonna save you um, a lot of bandwidth considerations, a lot of cost when you're allocating bandwidth. And it's gonna lower your latency and just increase your overall performance. Moving outside of that, this is more what I think of with the metropolitan area network. So again, uh, University of Pittsburgh is gonna be like somewhere right there, I wanna say. And it's going to be connected to this entire region. So there's an entire backbone going on through here through you know every different direction. And this is gonna be controlled more like the tier one or the tier two backbone um, with internet service providers, um, which is going to be a little bit more closer to home. So your tr distance traveling inside of this region, and this is kind of made up, but to travel from the University of Pittsburgh to something over here in Bethel Park, it's going to be a lot faster because you're switching through a lot less networks. So you're going to have, you know, an ISP in this region that's going to be handling a lot of that traffic and it's going to be doing it just back and forth to each other. It's not going to have to go from here to, you know, another point out here and then back in or anything like that. It's able to just go directly to sources a lot better. Then moving on, we're going to be talking about wide area networks. So this is when you think about how you connect with, you know, China or uh, Great Britain or Germany, if you connect to any of their servers for any reason, or even something, uh, you know, more local. Like if you were, you know, in Denver and you want to connect to a server in Washington, you're going to have to hop through a few different networks here. So let's say, you know, you're in Colorado Springs, there's going to be a metropolitan area network right there. It's going to go all the way up to that tier one backbone for the wide area network over here. That's going to have to hop through Chicago and through Washington, or it could go through Dallas, Fort Worth, up through Chicago, up through Washington, or, you know, there's probably other points here, let's say in, you know, Indiana or Kentucky. Um, that's going to allow you to make those hops, you know, to the other servers. And so you're going to be going from your LAN to a uh, metropolitan area network, take that metropolitan area network into a wide area network, go through that backbone into another wide area network to the metropolitan area network to another LAN. So they're all interconnected here. Um, it's just gonna be, again, how you travel through things. And again, this is gonna be the same way that a VPN is gonna work, where if you wanted to say you were out of Washington, but you were in Colorado Springs, you'd make those same hops for everything. And if you actually ended up connecting to, you know, Chicago, let's say, then you'd hop through, around, and back. Um, and that's kind of the basics of network topologies uh, uh, and scopes, really. And then moving on, let's, let's kind of talk about why this matters, right? So they're all interconnected. You know, you have a phone that's connected to a LAN that goes up to a, a, a MAN, to a WAN, that connects to Spotify. You take that all back and then you're going to connect to the personal area network and play music through your phone, through your car, or through a speaker, or you know, your AirPods, or whatever kind of Bluetooth sound setting, uh, sound devices you have. These all talk to each other and they all have to work with each other really well. And again, it's something you're gonna see in the real world. This is something you're doing day to day. Every time you know you log into YouTube or log into your bank, you are attached to all of these networks just to get whatever data you want back. And I mean, this is happening sub millisecond, really. Like we're seeing, you know, the ability for you to go to, you know, www.duckduckgo.com and you have results within like six to 20 milliseconds most of the time. And I mean, it's a bit more complex than that, but you are touching all of these every day, whether you know it or not, right? Um, and it's gonna affect how you design systems, how you design applications, how you increase your site reliability. You know, if you're a site reliability engineer or a cloud engineer, these are things you have to think about to increase reliability. You know, make sure you have plenty of uptime and you're meeting your service level agreements. It's going to affect your and impact your latency. So if you only have one server in Washington DC, but you have a lot of traffic coming from Turkey, well, that's going to increase the latency. It's gonna give you a worse user experience. And then also it's going to affect the design of how you design these systems, right? So understanding how connections are made and where they occur it's gonna help you design a more robust, more efficient, more quick system for connecting these services. 
then moving on, we can kind of start talking about network topology. So this is a lot more academic, um, and it comes down to how you want to design things, and there's you know use cases and benefits and downsides to each different type of network topology. And again, with networking scope, there are more than this, and they have different names sometimes, but these are kind of the core ones you're gonna see. So starting off with the bus, I wanna start here because it's kind of the most simple. So this is something where you have one backbone going through right here. It's usually gonna be a single direction, and then you connect points to it. So you know this could be like an ethernet cable with twisted off you know, RJ45 connections, right? And it's gonna go up to each device. And it's gonna go, you know, networking across through the pipeline, you know. And every time it needs to access a client, it's going to kind of send all that traffic out and make sure it reaches that specific client. Um, you, you might see this in cubicles or hotel rooms. It's kind of the best example I have where it's, you know, um, very local um, and it's not the most uh, it doesn't have to be the most reliable thing in the world. It doesn't have to have 99.999% uptime, right? Um, but really, you're not going to really see bus these days. It's not common. Um, I've never ran into a network where I've seen a bus topology. Um, but it is a simple one, and it's one that uh, you should probably have a general understanding. And again, so just to give you some definitions and some pros and cons of it, you have one backbone that connects the entire network all the data traffic, or all the traffic goes in one direction, and each computer has an individual connection to that backbone. So the reason you might use it, again, like for cubicles or hotel rooms, uh, it's simple and it's cost efficient, and it's really modular. So uh, let's say we added you know, another computer right here. All we have to do is add another connection to that backbone, right? So that makes it super easy to kind of add uh, or remove computers without affecting the network in a negative way. Um, cons of it, you have a single point of failure, right? So if we lose connection right, let's say here, these computers now no longer have a connection to the network, um, which is an issue, right? So it doesn't have a lot of fault tolerance built into it. Um, and as you increase and add more computers to this backbone, it's going to slow down because you're sending a lot of traffic through this backbone and it can only handle you know, however much bandwidth that ethernet or fiber or what have you cable can do, right? And uh, moving on, we're gonna talk about ring. Um, ring is also not that common. The best use case I've really heard of for ring is um, backups for hardware failure. So let's say you have you know, a star topology network, which we'll get into and you want to increase your uptime and your reliability, you might also implement a ring network to kind of act as a, a secondary network um, in case for whatever reason a node goes down or there's really high traffic on the star topology and you, you know, need these computers to be online. This is something you, again, probably more see with servers and stuff that's really important, um, but it also just isn't that commonly used these days. So um, it's decentralized and you have the node-to-node uh, -node communication here, right? So it can go both directions, which is really nice. So you get that benefit over bus where you can send traffic down this way or you can go up this way. So if you're trying to get to this computer over here, you don't have to go all the way around. You can just go directly to it, which is a huge benefit in comparison to bus. Um, and it's decentralized. So there's not really a strong way to manage and like control your infrastructure with this. Um, there could be upsides to that, there could be downsides, it really depends on your network. I would say most of the time that's a downside. But uh, again with bus it's really easy for that initial configuration, right? You just have to plug one wire into each computer, each computer kind of handles that traffic. Um, and they share the responsibility of you know keeping traffic moving to um, manage policies and rules um, but with that, you're going to have, again, a high failure rate because if any of those cables go out, it is still possible to communicate. So, you know, you can take still a lower uh, resistance path, but let's say this computer, you know, does go down or this wire does go down, you're going to have to actually, again, go all the way through the network. So it does have better failure rate than bus, but that's not saying a ton. And then it is difficult to troubleshoot because it's hard to tell when these connections go down. And then again, with the decentralization, it's difficult to manage. So especially with large corporate networks, you're going to want to make sure you have certain policies and rules in place, and that's really difficult to configure with Ring. 
Coming up next, we've got the most common one, I think, which is star. Um, so uh, I think star is everywhere, right? So your home network, if you use a router, you're using a star topology. So you have one centralized device right here that manages all the traffic, right? So you can have another connection out here that goes up to the internet. That is my picture of the internet. And it's gonna handle um, you know, this computer's traffic into it. Um, it's gonna handle the traffic back. It's gonna handle this computer's traffic. Um, every node connected to this that has to communicate uh, through IP or internet protocol is going to have to go through this centralized device. So again, uh, definition is a centralized network. All the traffic is gonna go through that same network hub and uh, there's no direct node to node connection here, right? So with ring topology and bus, you could kind of you know, make these connections um, where nowadays with star, if you wanna communicate between these two computers, you're going to have to go through the centralized hub, right? So there's no way to directly connect these without doing some kind of hybrid methodology. Um, so the uh, pros of it is easy management, you know, like you probably have a router sitting on like 192.168.either 0.1 or 1.1 and you go there to manage everything, any rules, any policies, any security. Uh, if you want to look at what devices are on your network, it's all done in one place. And it's also pretty cost effective. It's not the cheapest, but um, managing, you know, like you get an $80 router, you probably get one through your ISP. Um, it's really not that expensive when you have like multiple, like several hundred or several thousand dollars computers on the network. It's a lot cheaper than, you know, running some kind of big server to manage this. Um, and then really the big con with this is central hub failure. So if you lose, you know, um, a wire between your computer and the network uh, hub, you're done for, you have no more connection. If your hub goes out, you also have no more connection to the internet, right? Or intranet as well. So that's really the biggest downside. Um, it doesn't have quite the fault tolerance I think a lot of people would like, especially when you do get into the corporate environment. But for the average consumer, it's a really great solution and it's, um, it's very easy to manage, which is a really big plus. Then moving on, we've got mesh or peer-to-peer. -peer. It goes by a few other names as well. Um, this one gets a, a little messy, as you can see. Uh, you don't really see this uh, in the day-to-day. -day. I would say the most common example of this would be like a LAN party. You know, back in the day, you might have like four Xboxes or like six computers all playing the same game. Well, you can, you know, put one cable between each and connect that way. So any computer you want to talk to, you have a direct link to, right? So if this computer wants to connect to this one, it goes directly there. If it wants to talk to this computer, it goes directly to it. If this one wants to talk here, goes directly to it. You don't have to go between links. Um, you can, if there's for some reason, you know, uh, like a link that goes down, let's say, let's say that one goes down, you can still go through here. Um, but uh, yeah, this one's just, it's not that practical, you know, other than that LAN party, which I think most people who do a quote unquote LAN party nowadays are using a router to, you know, connect between devices. But yeah, so it's a one-to-one -one mapping and traffic goes directly from the sender to the recipient. So there's absolutely no um, you know, centralized hub here or it doesn't have to bounce between nodes. It goes directly from computer A to computer B um, or computer B to computer C. So biggest um, perk of using a mesh network is gonna be fault tolerance, right? So like I said, if for some reason one of these cables goes down, you have, you know, however many computers n minus one points of failure to deal with, right? So um, it's it's really great in that it is quite a resilient network. It's just not that common because it does have its own issues. And again, when it comes to managing this, it's very difficult. So it's going to have high configuration complexity as well because every time you add a computer, it has to get connected to you know with this one we have six computers down here. If you add another computer you have to get seven more cables to plug each one in, right? Um, so that's kind of a pain. And then also it's gonna be very expensive from a hardware perspective, because you know, uh, if you look at the back of your computer or your laptop, you might see one or two um, like LAN ports. Well, to work with a network like this, you're gonna need to add like probably multiple um, 
like ethernet adapters to your computer right so and then once you get to the point where you know maybe you're in a small office and you have 40 computers that is 40 computers that all have to connect to each other so it's just not that efficient it's not the most uh, reliable way to connect things and um, management on this is going to be really tricky as well so that's why you're really not going to see this outside of like you know three four five computers and then we've got tree um, where when i think of tree um, I kind of think of like corporate network design or like Active Directory Forest, if you're familiar with the concept. Um, but it makes it really easy. If you want to talk about the best way to manage a network, this is probably it. Um, once you start getting really complex with how you design your networks and how many you know, devices you have connected to it, a tree is going to make it really easy because you can have one router at the top of the chain that has its own rules and policies, and you pass that down into you know, four, five, six, seven, eight switches that you know continue that down and um, they can add their own rules and policies based on whatever the network needs or it can kind of just inherit the parents um, and it's going to allow you to have as many devices as your network needs um, and you can just kind of keep adding hardware as it becomes necessary so yeah um, with definition I call this like a star like multi-host design so again you can kind of still use a star-ish design model here, but all you're doing is kind of centralizing it up the stack, right? So rules and policies are applied downstream, which again makes it super easy for management. So if you are managing a network with a tree topology, you're gonna have a pretty easy time. And then so a, a really big use case for this is that it can connect to multiple networks. So uh, an example I can give here is me and my parents uh, used to share uh, you know, an ISP. Uh, we were, you know, in the same house, but we actually had three routers. Um, so one was a modem router combo, and then we split it off into two different routers because I mess with my networks and I don't want my downtime to affect their downtime. So we actually used a tree topology so we could manage our own network separately. Um, and that's something, again, that you can do in the corporate environment very easily. And then it's going to be hierarchical. So again, rules set at the parent are going to follow down into children nodes all the way. So it's going to make it very easy to, if you need the second floor to have different permissions than the first floor, um, or you want to have, you know, the accounting department have different rules and policies than the engineering department, that's going to be a really easy way to do it with a tree topology. Um, there are some downsides though. Um, so downstream nodes must inherit the upstream policies, right? So if something is set at a master router at the top, each slave of that device has to follow those rules as well. So that's going to make it a bit more difficult if you want to set some kind of custom configuration for a certain router or switch in your network. Um, but overall, you kind of just start very broad with your policies and get more narrow with scope as you go down. And then another one is VLAN and port forwarding. It's going to be more difficult to manage because you have to do it at each node in the tree that it goes up, right? So if the second floor, you know, room A, needs to do some kind of port forwarding, it's going to fall back to the second floor network, and then you're also going to have to put it at the overall network, right? So you're going to have to open, you know, port 443 or something on the 2A, the 2, and the overall network. And that's just going to make it a bit more difficult to manage, um, but overall, uh, I think that's a pretty fair trade-off. And lastly, we've got the hybrid approach. So this is a mesh network attached with um, multiple star topologies a hybrid network can be anything you want so it doesn't have to be this design you could do a bus mixed with a mesh um, that then goes into a star network if you want right hybrid is a very general term but it's something I think is worth bringing up because you're gonna see it a lot especially in corporate spaces where you have again so many networks and so many hosts and devices that you're working with so definition here again is just a combination of multiple network topologies and the best part about it is it can meet any use case and it's super malleable. So you can definitely do a very bottom up design approach here where as things are needed, you can plug and play add them, right? Um, so if you want to do a tree network, but for whatever reason you want five computers to be running mesh or peer to peer, you can, you know, hop that in and plug it in and it's all going to work. Um, the downsides to this though are going to be a, a little bit uh, less obvious. So it's going to be very specific 
And as a network engineer, it's going to be very difficult to inherit um, because you're going to have to, you know, look at network topology diagrams if they exist um, and make sure that you're, you know, meeting the same policies and you got to, you know, find why certain nodes may not be able to access other nodes um, or why certain rules and policies are getting applied to, you know, certain computers, but not others. It's because there's not really a centralized design ideology here. So it's just a bit more complex to manage as a network engineer and as an administrator. So um, kind of like with the other one, why does network topology matter? Well, anything using the IP or internet protocol is going to rely on topology, right? So topology is going to affect your complexity, your management, your speed, your reliability, and your traffic, and much more. Um, so. These are things you have to be thinking about when you're designing networks, uh, uh, network designs for you know whatever space you're working with. So you need to be thinking about the direction traffic's flowing. Do you have enough backbone? Um, what kind of fault tolerance do we have? Um, are links uh, you know meeting proper speed requirements for bandwidth? And how am I going to manage this network? You know these are all thoughts you have to have when you're designing a topology. Again, it's probably going to be some kind of hybrid. Um, and just understanding the different types and their benefits and their you know, pros and cons, it's really gonna help you better design a network topology for a certain space. And then network topology is also just important because it's required to communicate. Uh, you're going to have to use some kind of network topology, whether you think about it or not, whether you know, you're just throwing a router in um, and calling it good, or you're actually spending time creating a tree diagram and you know, designing your nodes to uh, inherit and manage proper connections between uh, different rules and different networks inside that subnetwork, right? So this is just a very basic overview of networking scope and topology, um, why you need to know them, what the benefits of the, uh, them are, and how they all kind of interconnect with each other, right? So hopefully you learned something. I'm hoping to make this a multi-part series. So I appreciate you watching and uh, hope you have a good rest of your day.